Welcome back, everyone, to the South End Zone. I am Chad. You see Tyler right there. We uh, we recapped the Georgia debacle against Ole Miss earlier, and as if the night wasn't bad enough already on Saturday night, LSU just like I don't know an avalanche of Jalen Milrow nightmares from last year returned this time in Death Valley, and Alabama just beats the doors off of LSU, forty-two to thirteen. One of the most embarrassing losses that I think I've witnessed in a while. Like, I don't even count. There's some of the ones where we just weren't good and Alabama was, and we got beat really bad. Um, this one was the, the college game day panel was like almost all LSU. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think Nick Saban was the only one who picked Alabama and he just kind of did it deferentially. Like, Oh, look, I coached those guys. I can't. Bet yeah. Against right. Them. Um, yeah, he was I, he was safe no matter what he said. Let's be real. I, I still maintain I I have yet to figure out this college football season because that Alabama team that lost to Vanderbilt, that lost to Tennessee, who lost to Arkansas, who LSU beat the hell out of, and then Ole Miss that came into Death Valley and LSU beat them. Granted, it was a weird game, um, but. LSU went to South Carolina at williams Rice Stadium and beat them in their own place. And, yes, you can say what you want about um, some calls that went LSU's way, some breaks, some bounces that went LSU's way. Yes, I, I concur. Um, but the thing is, there wasn't a 42-13 to 13 gulf between LSU and South Carolina and calls and breaks went our way. There wasn't a 42-13 to 13 gulf between Ole Miss and LSU and a few calls and breaks went our way. No, this was like these are two – very tightly contested games. And then that same South Carolina team went to Tuscaloosa, almost beat Alabama, had the opportunity to beat Alabama, had ball in hand, driving to score a go-ahead touchdown or get in field goal range and kick a game-winning field goal against Alabama. Um, and LSU just – a combination of Garrett and Nussmeyer making a couple of early key mistakes that cost LSU some chances in the red zone – and just some bad zone read fits that LSU just let Jalen Milrow run wild on him. And it all started with, you texted me right after the, the first third down conversion. LSU should have Alabama dead to rights and have them punting. And then LSU gets the ball to start the second half. We should be in good shape. And I think it was Savion Jones came up on the on, on Milrow's right side, on the left side of the, the defensive front. And over pursued and got inside and let Milrow go out and around. Like yep. you've got to come up and you've got to continue. We talked about this um, before the game. You've got to play disciplined pressure to where you are keeping him in that pocket and kind of compressing yeah. that pocket around him. You let him get outside that pocket. And what does he do? He finds Ryan Williams wide open in the flat. Yeah. So we're like, well, that's exactly so, what we said. Told him that we can't yeah. let happen. And and Williams didn't have like no, an amazing game. He catches. had the one. He had the one good. He had the one uh, kick return that that really flipped the field on us. Yeah, that was that was a big deal. Um, but other than that, it was basically it was Milrow and his feet. Milrow and his feet. Yeah, him running the ball and like we stuffed their run game like the first few possessions, and then we just let let him get off the hook. That's the and thing. then once once you get to that point, now it's a. 14 to six game you're driving down. Now you throw a pick in the end zone. Now you give them the ball back. Now they go down and they score. Now you're just like trying, okay, well, if we can just put a score on the, on the board, go to halftime, come back out, get another score to start the half. No, we don't do that. Uh, we end up anyway, it just, it avalanched out of control and it's, it's crazy. You know, we talked about it before with, all of the things that Georgia had going for it and then how inexplicable it was that they played as poorly as they did in Oxford with this one. It's, you know, all the, all the storylines, you know, this offensive line doesn't give up sacks. They were giving up pressure. Now, how big of a deal was it that Garrett Dellinger wasn't there? Uh, apparently it was big enough um, because they still, they, they allowed Alabama to get some pressure on Nussmeyer. Nussmeyer, didn't do a great job under that pressure, did take a sack or two. Um, and it was just this constant barrage of, you know, failure to 
get the offense going and really move it, or when you did yeah. stalling out in the red zone oh, oh no. and not and not getting points or turning the ball over. I think I texted um, you. I think I texted you because, like, for me watching you guys, like the turning point, like the point where of no return was right out of the second half, like right out of the first half, start of the third quarter. Mm -hmm. LSU has 14 plays, 71 yard drive that ends in a pick in the end zone. Yeah. I think I literally just texted you, like, that was it. Yeah. Like, that was the one. Like, I I think at that point, I like my, like, that's the thing about this podcast. And we were talking about a pre show. I'm like, we do this podcast, and now I have to be my my happiness now hinges on two teams, like in the same conference. Same like, here, I mean, like, same here. Yo, I was I was mad as hell watching the Ole Miss game. I was like, yeah. first of all, I can't stand Lane Kiffin, right? Me and neither. Then, and then second of all, it's just like I, I've got to watch, you know, and live vicariously through your misery. Yeah, same, um, and same and then, goes for you. And then set myself up for my own misery later. And, yeah. and it was crazy. Like I was I was telling T. Bob Abear when I went into Don Juan to watch the game um saturday night i was like hey man look it's uh it's road i mean it's home dog win weekend you know georgia tech Ole miss um i know like i at that point the dirt was already on your grave so like I yeah could, that's you know, fine like, it's fine it was just like all right you know i'm looking for i'm looking for I something some there. kind of signal you know like okay we're a home dog too this is our day let's go get it um no it did not happen that way it was uh it was just ugly from start to finish um that that opening drive was really like the combination of those two opening drives. So having them stopped on third down and then just mm-hmm. letting Milrow leak yep. and, and get a little dump off in the flat is the first part. Cause then they march down the field and get a touchdown. So now it's seven, nothing. Then you bust off a long run with uh Caden Durham. You're set up inside the 10 yard line. You're good to go first and goal from the five or whatever it was. And you just stall out and have to settle for a field goal. Yep. yep. And then it's just yeah. like, man, like you got to get points. You got to get points, but I mean, you really needed to get seven. Dude, yeah. Alabama taking 10 minutes worth of drives, right? And that, like two drives to combine for 10 minutes, like back, like yeah. a four minute drive. And a second. like Alabama, like actually, like with the way their offense is structured, actually dominating time of possession like that with how run and gun their offense mm-hmm. can sometimes mm-hmm. be. And yet, still, like, oh yeah, we're gonna make like a fifteen play, six minute draw. Like, I don't know. That's just, and that's the thing. It's like you took Ryan, Ryan Williams was like almost like a non factor to a point. And it yeah. was literally just like Milro <laughs> and Jam Miller running like the semi yeah. read option, but it really wasn't a read option because Milro was gonna run it every time. Like, yeah. and it's like you could account for Jam Miller, and you could account for Jalen Milro, but you somehow can't account for them at the same time. Like, it's I don't know. And Jam Miller's in the spectrum of ally running backs is mm-hmm. not high on my list, but he's not bad. Mm-hmm. Like he's a serviceable, he's yeah. still an Alabama running back for sure. Right. Right. But it's like, you can't ignore him. And like, Bill Red will take that and go and run with him. Like, Oh, here's the ball. Just kidding. I'm out the back door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Or that. And, and it's the worst part is that you guys can be good, great in coverage, but it doesn't matter when he's like, you said, he's leaking out. And he's yeah, still getting you can't, guard, you can't guard people forever, and yeah, that's and he's what I mean. Eventually run, and yeah, and then, yeah, and, and if you're not if you're not hanging with them toe to toe, um, because like you, if you remember last year, so Alabama scored just as many points last year on our terrible defense yep. as they did this year on what was supposedly a much improved defense. And I, I say supposedly tongue in cheek. This is an actually very much improved defense from last oh, year. Absolutely. Um, but this was this was embarrassing, and we just gotta you gotta wear it. Um, but but the difference was last year until Jaden Daniels got knocked out by Dallas Turner being a dirty bastard and, and hit hit him you know in the face mask um, and not getting ejected. But anyway, but deliberately targeting trying to knock him out of the game so that you don't have to like, like I I get it like football's a physical sport stuff happens and everything. But imagine. If LSU was deliberately going and trying to take out Jalen Milrow's knees, yeah, oh, I know. People would be calling us dirty little bitches for doing that. Yeah, and I'm I'm calling Dallas Turner out for being a dirty little bitch for for trying to take Jaden Daniels out and and gave him a concussion, took him out of the game. It was a dirty hit. It was it was helmet to helmet, um, drove his helmet into him. But anyway, that in that game, up until that point, it's a. 28-28 game, 
And I think at that point, I think maybe they had gone up by a touchdown mm -hmm. um, when he got knocked out. And then Nussmeyer had to come in and try to try to keep it going. And Alabama scored one more touchdown late. But at least with that game, we were matching them for the most yeah. part. Um, we, I think, I want to say we either took a 21, 14 or a 28, 21 lead in that game. And then they scored like, I think that's what it was. I think it was 28, 21. They scored the last three touchdowns of the game. Uh, I, um, yeah. And this one, it was never even like, yeah. I, I just, I felt like the whole game, I'm waiting for something positive to finally right. happen. It's and like nothing it's happen. happened. It's like it's like you almost like law of averages. Like it's got to happen yeah. eventually, right? Like, no, no. that's what I mean. Do, do our programs have a quarterback problem, Chad? I believe so, and I'm 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 really hoping that you know we don't have an issue like, with that pick in the end zone by Nussmeier was yeah. brutal. Like yeah, and, yeah. Like I'm and listen, Carson Beck has over ten, almost has as many. He's gonna pull a Jameis Winston and have the same amount of touchdowns as picks this year, but like. Yeah. Nussmeyer, like we talked about, like his, like he mixes, he throws such great balls and then just does that. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. almost like he, like, but he made, I think that throw was like, he made the preemptive throw where he thought that guy wasn't going to be there. So the ball yeah. was already out of his hand. And then all of a sudden, he's still, he's the receiver's still breaking there. open. The, the receiver's yeah. breaking open. But the thing is, he, similar to, to Beck, he will stare stuff down. Yeah. And it, and when you stare it down, you are inviting, that linebacker underneath yeah. to drop back. Yeah. Or it's and like somebody all, and who, then if you don't get enough elevation on that ball, then, yeah. cause I don't remember who he was throwing to, but it was yeah. CJ Daniels or um, maybe it was, uh, yeah, you're not even giving him a chance Lacey. to get over the, over the but, secondary. But that ball was going to hit him in the, in the bread basket. Like you yeah. gotta get that ball up, make him go up and, and high point it and, and come down on in the, in the back of the end zone and, and do the little toe tap. Um, but he threw it. I mean, I, that he rifled didn't even hard. Yeah, he didn't even hardly need to jump. I mean, this is the kind of thing you do in college football, where you know you hold down X too hard, <laughs> and uh, it throws it right to throws it right to the DV instead of lobbing it over the top of him and letting the receiver run under it. Um, yeah. Everything doesn't need to be a rocket throw. And, yeah. I, and look, I, Nussmeier. There's a lot that I that I like about Nussmeier. Mm. And there have been a lot of scouts who've, who've had, you know, good things to say about him as well. But you're getting to see a fuller body of work of both him and Beck. Yeah. And so to your point, yeah, I think there is a quarterback problem um, in, in in Baton Rouge and in Athens. And the only thing, you know, LSU's got Bryce Underwood yes, supposedly you do. ready to go and sign in, in, you know, three weeks, I guess it is, maybe a month. Yeah, um, really signing and so, next, next month, I think. Yeah, so – so that you know, there's been some little rumors and and um, grumblings of you know Michigan's going to uh, come through with this huge offer and everything. But like, do you really want to go play at no. Michigan, or like, do you want to come? Could, do you want to come and gonna... play? Do you want to come and play with elite receivers yeah. in an offense that is going to produce another Heisman Trophy winner? That's uh, already produced two in the last six years. Um, or do you want to go play for Michigan where you're going to be right there with JJ McCarthy and mm -hmm. John Navarre and Brian Greasy? And, you know, like the ball, they call it a ball caddy. You just hand it off to the running back. That's right. That's to right. the ball caddy. You, you take it from the center and give it to the running back. <laughs> yeah. So, and I know he's from like, you know, they say he's like 30 minutes from Ann Arbor is where he's, where he lives. So that there's like this, there's this assumption that he's just going to, that there's going to be a lean in that direction if the money's right. Yeah. But I, the way I look at it is this, and this is what I was trying to explain to somebody. Um, one of my friends at, at one of you know, one of my clients, um, he's a huge LSU fan and he's nervous about it. I was like, no man, listen, it's like, yeah, but what if they come through with this much money? Whatever. I was like, okay, you got to think about it like this. Do you want JJ McCarthy money and you take 7 million in NIL to get it? Or do you want Joe Burrow, Jaden Daniels money, and and you only take four and a half million in NIL money to get there? Yeah. Because that two and a half million that you leave on the table NIL money turns into two hundred million. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, no, for sure. I, your development is going to now you may be able to make the argument that if he goes wherever. 
he could go to freaking army and he'd still be able to garner uh, you know a huge contract i mean look shador sanders is probably going to get a huge contract and get drafted in the top five in this upcoming draft playing at colorado um but the chances of you but that that's kind of the shooter sanders thing is like a lightning in the bottle where else do you think you're going to go where you're going to have a guy like Deion sanders attract the type of wide receiver and and you know skill edge talent that they have yeah. for you to be able to throw the ball to because their offensive line is terrible and so it's just like hey man run around and then find somebody deep and those guys yeah. are going to get open so i i think with somebody like bryce underwood as talented as he is and having a relationship already with Joe Sloan, LSU's offensive corner. That's another story for another day. I was very disappointed in our offensive game plan, you know, play calling and all that, but uh, I digress. Um, you, you have that relationship already built in. And then yes, you have that pedigree of back to back Heisman trophy winners, essentially like the last, the last two legitimate quarterbacks, I don't count Miles Brennan, Max Johnson. Like that was in the, the COVID, everything was up in upheaval. Um, and you had some some issues with injuries and whatnot. But the last two guys who you could realistically look at as that type of talent, they got it done. They yep. ended up the number one overall pick and the number two overall pick in the NFL draft, both with Heisman hardware in their in their closets or if they're smarter than uh, Devontae Smith uh, on a mantle somewhere or in a, in a trophy cabinet. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's just, uh, I'm, I think that the, the quarterback problem that we have is why the collision course is over. Um, there's still an outside chance that LSU could still make it to the playoffs in this weird scenario. Like you guys are good where if you just went out, there's going to be enough other stuff. You beat Tennessee and you went out, you're, you should be okay and make it in. It might not be um, where you want to be, uh, you know, at that first round bye or anything like listen, that. Honestly, but though, you might like get a home a, game. A home game in Athens would be sick. Like, yeah. And listen now, and now, you know what? We actually, Georgia Tech might come to play. <laughs> yeah, no shit. It's, look, it's, it's start, And I, you know, I'm looking at Vanderbilt on the schedule and even Florida, even Florida this weekend coming up. Uh, I'm like, man, gosh, this is going to be. It's going to be wild uh, to wrap things up, but, but yeah. So if LSU wins out and Georgia wins out, you could potentially have with the loser of Texas, Texas A&M and all those other teams, you could potentially have, I'm going to pull up the standings here real quick. Give me just a second. Cause this is, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to see how crazy this scenario actually ends up being. So right now where we are is it's Tennessee, Texas A&M, Texas, all with one loss. Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, LSU, and Missouri, all with two losses, okay? Now, Texas and Texas A&M play each other. If you guys, I'm assuming you guys beat Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. That Hopefully. leaves Tennessee with two losses. <laughs> you remain with two losses. Texas, Texas A&M, loser, would have two losses. You could have Tennessee, the Texas, Texas A&M loser, Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, LSU, and Missouri all finish the season with two losses. The only okay. thing I, I'm not certain of is I've got to check to see, whoops, wrong. Uh, I was going to try to see uh, what the, who, who Missouri has left on their schedule. Let me just a second here. <clears throat> they have South Carolina, Mississippi state, Arkansas. Yeah. So none of those teams are playing each other. So you could have Missouri went out, finished with two losses. You could have, Georgia, Tennessee, uh, the Texas, Texas A&M loser, LSU, Alabama, and Ole Miss all finished <laughs> with two losses for like a seven-way tie for second place in the SEC. And then the tiebreakers start getting crazy because you can't use head-to-head -head because they haven't all played each other. You mm -hmm. can't use common opponents because they don't have common opponents with each other. Yeah. They, they might have – I'd be surprised if they have one common opponent that all yeah. seven of those teams have played. Because there's so many teams in the SEC, it's really difficult. So it goes down to the 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 like the the tiebreaker that is most likely to decide it is the combined winning percentage of your SEC opponents. And in that case, if you played Mississippi State, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Auburn, you're in trouble. 
because your conference opponent winning percentage is going to be terrible. We played three of those four. <laughs> and you played three of those four. And Texas played a couple of them. And Ole Miss play, is going to play Mississippi State. Uh, Alabama is going to play Auburn and already played um, Mississippi State. Yep. Or did they? Uh, yeah. no. no, they didn't. No, no, but Texas did, and Texas A&M Texas did. did. Yes. And Texas A&M did. So, yep. so th- it could get into this thing where – very quickly, you could be looking at. I don't know. I haven't like gone through and done all the numbers to to figure out where it actually lands. But there's a weird outside opportunity that LSU, because of who they've played in the SEC, their the winning percentage of their opponents that includes Ole Miss, Texas A and M, South Carolina, um, Vanderbilt, like and uh, who really we're talking about Vanderbilt um and then yes you have Oklahoma and uh and Florida in there too oh and Arkansas so uh, you know Arkansas has a good record a good enough record mm-hmm. and then you've got you've got losses to a couple of the teams that you'd be tied with so like those records aren't going to hurt you you don't have Kentucky Auburn Mississippi State on your schedule you only have one of those one loss or one win teams so I don't know. It's it's very possible. Um, you could see LSU still find their way into the SEC championship game. And then wouldn't that be crazy if it'd be like an LSU Texas AM rematch for the oh SEC God. championship game? And then Texas AM is still Texas eight and four until proven otherwise. So we talked about in the Georgia Ole Miss episode that Georgia gets this benefit of the doubt from the media that they are uh, a championship contender until proven otherwise, just like Alabama always is. Well, Texas A&M, you are a pretender until proven otherwise because you always end up eight and four somehow or another, and I see it happening again this year. I don't see you uh, escaping that, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, maybe you'll get to the the SEC championship game, in which case you would only have two losses at that point. And LSU would then be able to hang your your third on you. So, Texas A&M fans, I know you're in the comments. We see you all the time coming in there talking trash. You've ne- still never won anything, so whatever like keep yapping that's all y'all do is chatter um y'all are the preseason national champions the off-season national champions Mm -hmm. the recruiting national champions that we just (laughs) hired a new coordinator national champions you give jimbo fisher a national championship trophy that will never be won because y'all are retarded um but keep congratulating yourselves i got a proposal you guys are paying Jimbo. F- I have been not coaching football all my life. <laughs> I'm just saying. You guys, I'd be so happy for y'all to pay me to not coach football. I'm so good at not coaching football. I might be better than Jimbo Fisher not coaching football. But you guys I will stop him. calling you yeah. Texas 8-4 and four if you pay me to not coach your team like you're paying Jimbo <laughs> Fisher to not coach your team. Okay? How about we, that? We are two professional not football coaches. We're so good at it. <laughs> We're so good at not coaching. Uh, we I, like he's not even that good at not coaching. Yeah, he coached so much. That's what I. Why do they keep paying him for not coaching? He's not even good at it. We're way better. <laughs> uh, uh, I couldn't even imagine great, being on the hook for this. I couldn't even imagine being on the hook for for that much money on somebody we're paying to not do their job. Oh my gosh! Like, it's, the, it's it's it, Jimbo Fisher is the Bobby Bonilla of uh, yeah right of football. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to pay him a million dollars for the next 75 years or something. Uh, him and Shohei Otani. Um, right. Anyway. Oh, my God. But uh, anyway, we, we appreciate even the Texas A&M fans who come into the comments. So please comment, yeah. like, share, subscribe. Share this with all your SEC fan friends. Even people outside the SEC, we're going to come back in a little bit and do a uh, – uh, a preview, or not a preview, but a, a recap of uh, the the rest of the games inside and outside, mostly outside the SEC, because there were there were a couple of well, the, the slate wasn't good, but there it still produced some good matchups um, that shouldn't have been as close as they were, and a couple of upsets. So we are going to dig into that in our next episode. We appreciate you coming through. Uh, please continue to join us. We love having y'all here. South End Zone is out. I'm Chad. He's Tyler. Peace, y'all.